Colorado. I just thought that was a bad idea. That's why I'm here. We hadn't seen each other, what, 44 years? Somewhere around 40? 68. 68. We, yep. we flew over, over together, served together, came back together. Came back together. And this is the first time we've seen e each other. Since 1968. That looks interesting. <laughs> First group to land there, get boots. March of '61. Yep. Uh, there was nobody there. We were there uh, to secure the airstrip, and we secured it for about uh, the first, let's say, four or five weeks before anything started coming to land in there and uh, unloading the planes, doing security. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to the Air Force Museum. Uh, that's what I call it. Uh, it's got a name of National Museum of the United States Air Force, but I've been at Wright Pat for so many years, it's the Air Force Museum. Uh, that's all, all it's going to be. Uh, we're here to dedicate a memorial to all the people that served at UDORN in any capacity. Uh, we have Marines here, we have officers here, we have enlisted here. We've got a little bit of ev everybody. And right now, if I could ask you to stand, and we'll have the posting of the colors. Colors, colors turn, heart. We're gathered here for a solemn occasion. We're to honor them and memorialize the men and women who proudly served our nation at Udorn Royal Thai Air Force Base, Thailand. Our ranks are made up of the Air Force, the Navy, the Marine Corps, Coast Guard, Air America, CIA, and probably a few others that we'll never know about. But we were a mixed bag. We all had a different mission. We all did it well. And I'm proud to be able to, to be here as, as your MC, just to relate a little bit of it. I'd like to introduce some special guests. Our, uh, our speaker today will be Lieutenant General retired Jack Hudson. He is the current director of the Air Force Museum. We'll have uh, 
and he'll be accepting the, the, the plaque. We have Father Michael Kreutzer here who will be providing our invocation and our benediction. And of course, everyone here is a VIP, is an important person. Before I get into formalities, I'd like to offer my thanks to several of the individuals who worked diligently with me to make this happen. There were many people, but the ones that were really my sidearms were Jim Porter, Jim was supposed to be standing up here today, but he had a medical emergency and could not fly. He sends his regrets. Uh, those of you that don't know, he, he was the money man behind the plaque and all. He stood up, he paid the bill, and you folks came through and we reimbursed him 100%. We even got like 10 or 12 bucks left. So if we could have a round for Jim, and if you could say it, just a little small, small prayer for him. Uh, Jerry Long, Jerry was at uh, Udorn, just like all of us. He has been the guy that has worked the telephones, the internet, doing the research, just been a jack of all trades. Anything that came up, Jerry handled. Jerry, you know, I asked him to be the one that actually presents the plaque to the museum. And we have Kimberly. Kimberly, as I said earlier, she'll be helping. Uh, and she's doing this, you know, in, in memory of her father. Now, a little history. By way of history, our group came from an idea of two people, Ron Sell, Dave Wiggins. I don't know which one was first, but the two of them decided that there should be a history recorded of what happened at Udor in Thailand. A lot of people have gone through that installation. A lot of projects were done there and they felt it was important that that be recorded. So they started digging through declassified documents, anything they could find. And they realized that they really couldn't do it just by that alone. They had to have some help. They went out on the internet uh, looking for what we call Udornites, Udorn alumni. Anybody that had anything to do with Udorn, please contact them. And right now we've got right at 400 members around the world that were at Udorn. All of us have contributed in some way to them writing the history. There is a video back at the hotel that shows part of what they have done. Hopefully they will be able to get the book finished soon, we can hope. You know, it's, it's, they're writing a book of all, all books and it's gotta come to an end at some time and we hope it's soon. But uh, we've got one of the gentlemen lives in the Philippines, one lives in Thailand. And so for them to communicate back and forth to one another, then communicate with us, it's been a challenge, but they're doing it well. You'll also find a letter back at the hotel from Dave expressing his regrets that he couldn't be here, but his appreciation for all that you folks have done. The Marines were the first one in to Thailand back in 1961. We have the first security guard. Marine security guard. We got old Speedy Gonzalez over here. It was his birthday yesterday, I think. He said he was 17, the candle said he was 71. So I, I don't know if the 17 was when he was at, in Udorn or what he thinks he is today. But he was the first, first security guard and as often happens, his commander came in later. Major, Major Yubrin showed up after, after Speedy had secured the site, you know, it, you know, he came in. Major was an outstanding commander there. I, I, I say commander, I, I'm not sure how the, the Marine Corps does it, platoon boss, battalion boss, whatever, but he was the man with the plan. He was the go-to go person. We'll start off a little bit, like I say, 1961 was when the Marines went in, and I believe that was called, if I'm not mistaken, if, I, if I'm wrong, correct me, that was Operation Millhouse, I think. Mill Pond. Mill Pond, I'm sorry, Mill Pond. That was the first official 
recognition of anything happening there at Udorn. Then in February 1962, there was a young guy named Bill Young and a CIA pilot named Ron, Ron Sutphin who were tasked to fly from Udorn, and forgive me if I pronounce some of the words wrong, Long 10, and determined it to be a good location for a major secret base in Laos. So here in 1962, before there's a war or anything else, we're in there, and, and there is a war. July 62, politics and all came in, and as a good faith, the first Marine combat units were withdrawn uh, from Udorn as a display of good faith in accord with or in compliance with the G Geneva Accords. I did find in the history that when they left, sales receipts at the barber shop and the liquor outlet declined. <laughs> So I, I guess they maintained their military marine haircut there and kept themselves hydrated. Uh, December 63, sink pack, <clears throat> excuse me, term we don't, we don't use anymore. The, the only sink is the, pi, or is the president now, but the commander in chief of PACAF recommended that a detachment of the first air commando wing from Eglin Air Force be deployed to Udorn. It was code named water pump. So now in 63, we've got, we had the Marines in there, and if truth be known, I bet there were still some Marines there, and we bring in the Air Commandos. Their primary mission at that time was to teach mercenary pilots to fly T-28s, and later Laotian pilots, Thai pilots, and assorted others. But they were in there to train the local forces. Then we had a, a man named Tony Poe. Tony Poe was with the CIA. If you've watched uh, the movie Apocalypse Now, there was a crazy colonel in there and they couldn't control him. Well, the movie was based in part on Tony Poe. Tony Poe, probably the best way I'd describe him is he was Rambo. Uh, he was the guy that the CIA sent into, into Laos and Cambodia and said organize the Mayo and the Hmong into a fighting force. He quite often did things that the CIA did not like that he was not supposed to do. He was a non-combatant but he was a combatant. He, he was the guy that he couldn't get in battle and not participate in that battle. As a result, he was reprimanded. He didn't take it well. He complained a lot. He drank more, and they transferred him. When his time was up, it is said that he commanded a force of roughly 10,000 insert or counterinsurgent troops. Don't know if it's true or not. He did all, all that. He died in 1983 in, in California. In late 1965, <clears throat> there, was a, there was a thing that happened that was never explained when I was reading the history. But, and it was very, very specific. It said five married CIA officers were sent to Laos, being forced to go there with an agreement that their wives would be employed at Udorn Air Base. Now, why, why that specific reference was in, 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 in the history, I don't know, but we, we, they specifically sent five married. So, who knows? <clears throat> February 66 to 555, the famous triple nickel arrived. They brought in their F-4Cs. April 1966, 20th Helicopter Squadron made in incursions into Laos and North Vietnam as a part of our secret war in Laos. 1967, there were two Buddhist monks caught with cameras and maps on the mountain near Phu Phi Thai. Uh, it was called Command Club. They were taken into custody. They were held. They were then flown off the mountain by helicopter and delivered to Vang Pao the general of the Laotian forces 
for questioning. They were never seen again. Triple Nickel returned to Udorn. They just couldn't get enough of a good thing, I guess, so they came back. July 68, <clears throat> when I was there on, on the flight line, was the first Thai Air Force base ever attacked by sappers. I remember that night, I was on the flight line. I was in one of the dispatch trucks. We call them bread box trucks, bread vans, whatever. And we saw some flashes, some sounds, uh, sort of things we didn't really know. And so we decided to go look. I mean, you gotta go look if you see something. And as we're going down there, the man operating the truck got on the radio, called into dispatch and said, hey, there's something going on at the end of the flight line, we're gonna go look. And it came back on the radio that we were under enemy fire. Discretion being the better part of valor at the time, the guy stopped the truck, turned around, did a U-turn, and we took off like a bat out of hell. You know, we, we did not hang around. We had folks with, with sidearms and rifles that were supposed to take care of that. It turns out the reason that raid w was held was we had been promised, or the American government had been promised, that three POWs were, were to be released that night. And they would be flown into Udorn. So we brought in a C-141 medevac. And that medevac was standing by on the end of the runway and was gonna pick those POWs up. Well, many of you know, the POWs were not released that day, but the sapper attack still came in. The 141 was shot up, a number of sappers were killed, there were a number of Americans wounded. I don't think, and I may, may be wrong, but I don't think any Americans, or there was one, the, the, there was a guy on, on, on the aircraft did die of his wounds. Uh, let see, what else? Uh, then we got to April of 70. We had a battle damaged F-4 trying to make it back to Udorm. Some of you, of you were there, may have seen it. The F-4 crashed in to the radio station. It killed nine airmen. 1970, and this is a little, little off script from what the general was given Thursday, but uh, Colonel Bull Simons was selected to lead a force into the Songte prison camp to release POWs. Up until I started doing this little research for this, I always assumed that was an operation flown from the United States and that was it. It, it started off at Eglin. They built a full-size model of the prison camp. They took it down every day when the Russian satellites flew over, put it back up, they trained on it again, took it apart and did that until they were proficient at how they were gonna go into that prison camp. Five hours before takeoff, sitting at Udorn in one of the hangars, and I don't know which, which hangar, Colonel Simons had his last briefing with his troops. He said, we are going to rescue 70 American POWs, maybe more, from a camp called Song Te. This is something to expect from their fellow, uh, this is something American prisoners have a right to expect from their fellow warriors. The target is 23 miles west of Hanoi. He continued with, you are to let nothing, he repeated nothing, interfere with this operation. Our mission is to rescue prisoners it is not to take prisoners. And if we walk into a trap, if it turns out that they know we're coming, don't dream about walking out of North Vietnam unless you have wings on your boots. It's the wrong part of the world for a big retrograde movement. If there's been a leak, we'll know it as soon as the second or third chopper sets down. That's when they'll cream us. If that happens, I want to keep this force together. 
we will back up to the Song Kong River and by Christ, let them cross that goddamn open ground. We'll make them pay for every foot across the son of a bitch. As we know, there were problems with that raid. The prisoners had been moved. And in many, many cases, people would say it was a failure. I would say it was success from the willpower, the cooperation, and the determination of the people that went in. And in the history of that raid, it said they started with a hundred and something individuals. And Colonel Simons had to cut it to 55. And that's what he did at Udor. He had to tell the 55 that were going, who were generally pleased, they stood up and cheered. The others were somewhat PO'd because they didn't get to go. And they were ready to go. 1970, we had an RF-4C shot down over Laos. Crew was successfully recovered. <coughs> Interestingly enough, one of our members, Don Bailey, was the individual that packed their parachute. You know, so we're, we're involved in ev everything. Now this has been but a snapshot of Udorn. There were so many things that went on there, so many operations. Many of us were just ramp rats. We just did what we were told. We serviced the airplane, we launched them, we repaired them, that sort of thing, we covered them. But there were many, many things that went on. Many people still bear scars of their time there. Some of us, I was not one of them, served numerous tours in Southeast Asia. As we interact, as we interact during the reunion, our, our, our time together, I'm sure that many more previously unheard stories will surface. Being a member of the team that brought us to this point, that brings out memories that have been long forgotten. I located a friend that went to Thailand with me. Excuse me. We were best, we were best friends there for that memorial year, but lost contact. We just re-met. Thank you for giving me the honor of being the host this day. At this time, would Jerry Long and Kimberly Davis please come forward for the unveiling of the memorial plaque. Okay, hopefully we get up there. Would you please unveil the plaque? For those of you that haven't seen it or peeked, it's the bottom plaque. Okay. General Hudson, would you please join us? It was a, a great honor to serve at Udorn, and it's even a greater honor to present this plaque to the United States Air Force Museum. Uh, this plaque will put out a permanent message so the future generations can read and learn and see <laughs> what the war in Thailand was waged for and what was done. And uh, it's a great privilege to donate this plaque Thank you very much. and have it under your guardianship at this beautiful facility. I hope everybody can enjoy it. Thank you, sir, for accepting. I'll just tell you a couple of quick things. First off, uh, thank you for uh, allowing us to have the uh, privilege of taking care in perpetuity of your plaque. Uh, the whole memorial park here is uh, full of benches and plaques and other um, ways of recognizing those who uh, served and uh, those who came before us. As we do this today, let's keep in mind all of our uh, troops who are currently deployed from the Air Force alone, some 32,000 who are in harm's way, many others from the Army, the Marines, the Coast Guard, and other services. So let's keep all of them in our thoughts and prayers. They're doing a great job out there, and most of them are youngsters, 20-somethings, uh, a great uh, sacrifice to uh, life and limb. Uh, for all of you here, thank you for your service to our nation from uh, all services, and for the families here, 
And for those who couldn't make it or those who have passed on, uh, on behalf of all of us here at the museum, staff, volunteers, cleaning crew, and everyone else who makes this museum successful, thank you for your service to our nation. Um, again, it's our privilege to uh, be able to take care of this for you. We hope that you uh, very much enjoy your time here over the next couple of days, and uh, we are here to help you out uh, should you need it during your visit. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. It was a privilege for us to, to come here. Will Father Korchner uh, please rise for the, or come to the benediction? Would the rest of us rise, standing through the retirement of the colors and the playing of taps? Father Korchner. Creator of all, we remember before you with grateful hearts all those who served at Eudorn Air Base, whom we honor today, and all the men and women of our country who in the day of decision ventured much for the liberties we now enjoy. Grant that we may not rest until all the people of this land share the benefits of true freedom and gladly accept its disciplines. We commend to your gracious care in keeping all the men and women of our armed forces at home and abroad. Defend them day by day with your heavenly grace. Strengthen them in their trials and temptations. Give them courage to face the perils which beset them and grant them a sense of your abiding presence wherever they may be. And now, O oh Lord, support us all the day long until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes. The busy world is hushed, the fever of life is over, and our work is done. Then in your mercy, grant us safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at the last. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The uh, one thing that I wanted to say that uh, was very good for us here was the staff at the museum. In particular, we had Jane Leach. Jane could not be here today, but she worked tirelessly bringing this, this together. So, sir, to us, we thank you for your, your museum, your words, your support, but uh, give Jane a pat on the back for us. We'll do. Yeah. Honor Guard will now retire the colors. Colors, colors turn, heart. As far as closing remarks, this brings us to the end of the dedication. 
But before we, we, we close it, I fail to, to thank our, our bugler playing taps. Fail to thank the honor, honor Guard. I thank all of them. I'm sure most of you remember the Honor Guard is a volunteer position. It's not their job. It's an honor to be in the Honor Guard. Again, sincere thanks to the museum and staff, to all our attendees for making this memorial event. Our history is now recorded forever. For those of you that came up and reminded me, uh, I forgot to mention the U.S. Army. The U.S. Army was a big part in the operation, and we did it to see if you were paying attention. And you were. All of it. Thanks again to everybody that, that came out. We've had a wonderful time. It's been a wonderful time hosting. Thanks. See you next, next year or at the next reunion. Take care. No, we were the first uh, security unit. We went in from the 3rd Marine Division as a uh, in reinforced in infantry platoon, and they uh, we took care of the security for the base, and uh, we also took care of a town patrol for them so people could go on liberty. And uh, Colonel Johnson, who was the commander of MAB-16, was our boss, and we worked directly uh, for him, did what he wanted us to do, or <laughs> In some cases, we did what we wanted to do too. So, but we took care of everybody in town and watched out. He was very concerned, especially in town, about people being grabbed by, because the intelligence people were concerned that people were going to be grabbed in town. But our basic job there was to uh, provide security for the base and then uh, to build the camp and uh, for Air America. So we built the camp out of solid mahogany because that's the wood that we had. <laughs> And the engineers put the wood uh, down in the ground six feet and up six feet and built a platform and then they put strong back tents on top of that. And prior to that, they had brought in the UH-34 helicopters and Air America was flying up to Vinci and Laos, which by air was about 35 miles from us across the Mekong River up there. And then they, they worked out of Vinci and Laos and were flying supplies and troops up against the path of Lao. We uh, fortunately never got shot at in our area, but uh, we were ready if they were going to shoot at. We we had taken plenty of ammunition in there. We never had to use it, but uh, yeah, anyhow, it was a really interesting operation, and it was very interesting working with all the different elements that uh, we grunts normally don't work with. Well, I enjoy being here with all these men. It's uh, a lot of good guys. I mean, one of the reasons I stayed in the Marine Corps and took a regular commission rather than a reserve commission was 
I enjoyed working with these guys. It wasn't because they paid me any money because they didn't pay for beans, okay? And it wasn't for a career opportunity. I was making more money working in the steel mills at Bethlehem Steel than I, than I was ever made in the Marine Corps. So, but I enjoyed working with guys like this. They were great guys and it was a lot of fun working with them. And so that was, it was like being, you know, being a platoon commander or a company commander in the Marine Corps was like being a football coach only had these guys 24 hours a day. And and it, they were amazing guys. Even when I was in Vietnam, they were just amazing guys. I mean, you, you can't believe the stuff that they did. And when we were in Udor and the stuff that they did, they walked post all night and went to town patrol, worked with, uh, with Thai policemen and Thai MPs. None of them could speak English. None of us could speak Thai. And somehow it all worked out, and we took care of our people, and and uh, you know we lost nobody. Nobody got killed. You know everybody watched out for everybody. I mean there was a couple of times on the flight line I thought we were gonna you know have trouble and so forth. Man, somebody's gonna get hurt, but you know people watched out for each other. You can't. It's hard to explain to you what how guys operate together. And and I know these Air Force guys did, did the same thing. Uh, they watched out for each other, took care of each other, and made sure their aircraft were in as best shape as they possibly could. You know, just standing around talking to these guys, listening, it was 40 years ago, these guys were there. They still can tell you how to fix an F-4. <laughs> you don't do bad yourself. <laughs>